Chapter 6 When Livius Drissus, a bold and energetic man, had the support of a huge crowd drawn from all Italy proposed new laws and the evil measures of the Gracchi, seeing no way out for his policy, which he could neither carry through nor abandon when once started on, he is said to have complained bitterly against the life of unrest he had had from the cradle, and to have exclaimed that he was the only person who had never had a holiday even as a boy. For while he was still a ward and wearing the dress of a boy, he had the courage to commend to the favor of a jury those who were accused, and to make his influence felt in the law courts, so powerfully indeed that it is very well known that in certain trials he forced a favorable verdict. To what lengths was not such a premature ambition destined to go? One might have known that such a precocious hardihood would result in the great personal and public misfortune, and so it was too late for him to complain that he had never had a holiday when from boyhood he had been a troublemaker and a nuisance in the forum. It is a question whether he died by his own hand, for he fell from a sudden wound received in his groin, some doubting whether his death was voluntary, no one whether it was timely. It would be superfluous to mention more who, though others deemed them the happiest of men, have expressed their loathing for every act of their years, and with their own lips have given true testimony against themselves. But by these complaints they changed neither themselves nor others. For when they have vented their feelings and words, they fall back into their usual round. Heaven knows, such lives as yours, though they should pass the limit of a thousand years, will shrink into the merest span. Your vices will swallow up any amount of time. The space you have, which reason can prolong, although it naturally hurries away, of necessity escapes from you quickly. For you do not seize it, you neither hold it back nor impose delay upon the swiftest thing in the world but you allow it to slip away as if it were something superfluous and that could be replaced. Chapter 7 But among the worst I count also those who have time for nothing but wine and lust, for none have more shameful engrossments. The others, even if they are possessed by the empty dream of glory, nevertheless go astray in a seemly manner. Though you should cite to me the men who are avaricious, the men who are wrathful, whether busied with unjust hatreds or unjust wars, these all sin in more manly fashion. But those who are plunged into the pleasures of the belly and into lust bear a stain that is dishonorable. Search into the hours of all these people, see how much time they give to accounts, how much to laying snares, how much to fearing them, how much to paying in court, how much to being courted, how much is taken up in giving or receiving bail, how much by banquets, for even these have now become a matter of business and you will see how their interests, whether you call them evil or good, do not allow them time to breathe. Finally, everybody agrees that no one pursuit can be successfully followed by a man who is busied with many things. Eloquence cannot, nor the liberal studies, since the mind, when its interests are divided, takes in nothing very deeply, but rejects everything that is, as it were, crammed into it. There is nothing the busy man is less busied with than living. There is nothing that is harder to learn. Of the other arts there are many teachers everywhere. Some of them we have seen that mere boys have mastered so thoroughly that they could even play the master. It takes the whole of life to learn how to live, and, what will perhaps make you wonder more, it takes the whole of life to learn how to die. Many very great men, having laid aside all their encumbrances, have renounced riches, business, and pleasures, have made it their one aim, up to the very end of life, to know how to live yet the greater number of them have departed from life confessing that they did not yet know. Still less do those others know. Believe me, it takes a great man and one who has risen far above human weaknesses not to allow any of his time to be filched away from him. And it follows that the life of such a man is very long because he has devoted wholly to himself whatever time he has had. None of it lay neglected and idle. None of it was under the control of another, for, guarding it most grudgingly, he found nothing that was worthy to be taken in exchange for his time. And so that man had time enough, but those who have been robbed of much of their life by the public have necessarily had too little of it. And there is no reason for you to suppose that these people are not sometimes aware of their loss. Indeed, you will hear many of those who are burdened by great prosperity cry out at times in the midst of their throngs of clients, or their pleadings in court, or their other glorious miseries. I have no chance to live, of course you have no chance. All those who summon you to themselves turn you away from your own self. 
of how many days has that defendant robbed you, of how many that candidate, of how many that old woman wearied with burying her heirs, of how many that man who is shamming sickness for the purpose of exciting the greed of the legacy hunters, of how many that very powerful friend who has you and your like on the list, not of his friends, but of his retinue. Check off, I say, and review the days of your life. You will see that very few, and those the refuse, have been left for you. That man who had prayed for the fasces, when he attains them, desires to lay them aside and says over and over, When will this year be over? That man gives games, and, after setting great value on gaining the chance to give them, now says, When shall I be rid of them? That advocate is lionized throughout the whole forum, and fills all the place with a great crowd that stretches farther than he can be heard, Yet he says, When will vacation time come? Everyone hurries his life on and suffers from a yearning for the future and a weariness of the present. But he who bestows all of his time on his own needs, who plans out every day as if it were his last, neither longs for nor fears the morrow. For what new pleasure is there that any hour can now bring? They are all known, all have been enjoyed to the full. Mistress Fortune may deal out the rest as she likes. His life has already found safety. Something may be added to it, but nothing taken from it, and he will take any addition as the man who is satisfied and filled takes the food which he does not desire and yet can hold. And so there is no reason for you to think that any man has lived long because he has gray hairs or wrinkles. He has not lived long. He has existed long. For what if you should think that a man had had a long voyage who had been caught by a fierce storm as soon as he left harbor? And swept hither and thither by a succession of winds that raged from different quarters, had been driven in a circle about the same course. Not much voyaging did he have, but much tossing about. CHAPTER Eight. I am often filled with wonder when I see some men demanding the time of others, and those from whom they ask it most indulgent. Both of them fix their eyes upon the object of their requests for time, neither of them on the time itself, just as if what is asked were nothing what is given, nothing. Men trifle with the most precious thing in the world, but they are blind to it because it is an incorporeal thing, because it does not come beneath the sight of their eyes, and for this reason it is counted a very cheap thing, nay, of almost no value at all. Men set very great store by pensions and doles, and for these they hire out their labor or service or effort. But no one sets a value on time. All use it lavishly as if it cost nothing. But see how these same people clasp the knees of physicians if they fall ill and the danger of death draws nearer. See how ready they are, if threatened with capital punishment, to spend all their possessions in order to live. So great is the inconsistency of their feelings. But if each one could have the number of his future years set before him, as is possible in the case of the years that have passed, how alarmed those would be who saw only a few remaining, how sparing of them they would be and yet it is easy to dispense an amount that is assured, no matter how small it may be, but that must be guarded more carefully which will fail you know not when. Yet there is no reason for you to suppose that these people do not know how precious a thing time is, for to those whom they love most devotedly they have a habit of saying that they are ready to give them a part of their own years. And they do give it, without realizing it, but the result of their giving is that they themselves suffer loss without adding to the years of their dear ones. But the very thing they do not know is whether they are suffering loss. Therefore, the removal of something that is lost without being noticed they find is bearable. Yet no one will bring back the years. No one will bestow you once more upon yourself. Life will follow the path it started upon, and will neither reverse nor check its course. It will make no noise. It will not remind you of its swiftness. Silent it will glide on. It will not prolong itself at the command of a king or at the applause of the populace. Just as it was started on its first day, so it will run. Nowhere will it turn aside, nowhere will it delay. And what will be the result? You will be engrossed, life hastens by. Meanwhile, death will be at hand, for which, willy-nilly, you must find leisure. Chapter 9 Can anything be sillier than the point of view of certain people? I mean those who boast of their foresight. They keep themselves very busily engaged in order that they may be able to live better. They spend life in making ready to live. They form their purposes with a view to the distant future, yet postponement is the greatest waste of life. 
It deprives them of each day as it comes. It snatches from them the present by promising something hereafter. The greatest hindrance to living is expectancy, which depends upon the morrow and wastes today. You dispose of that which lies in the hands of fortune. You let go of that which lies in your own. Whither do you look? At what goal do you aim? All things that are still to come lie in uncertainty. Live straight away. See how the greatest of bards cries out, and, as if inspired with divine utterance, sings the saving strain. The fairest day in hapless mortal's life is ever the first to flee. Why do you delay, says he? Why are you idle? Unless you seize the day, it flees. Even though you seize it, it will still flee. Therefore, you must vie with time's swiftness in the speed of using it. And, as from a torrent that rushes by and will not always flow, you must drink quickly. And, too, the utterance of the bard is most admirably worded to cast censure upon infinite delay, in that he says, not the fairest age, but the fairest day. Why, to whatever length your greed inclines, do you stretch before yourself months and years in long array, unconcerned and slow, though time flies so fast? The poet speaks to you about the day, and about this very day that is flying. Is there, then, any doubt that for hapless mortals, that is, for men who are engrossed, the fairest day is ever the first to flee? Old age surprises them while their minds are still childish, and they come to it unprepared and unarmed, for they have made no provision for it. They have stumbled upon it suddenly and unexpectedly. They did not notice that it was drawing nearer by the day. Even as conversation or reading or deep meditation on some subject beguiles the traveler, and he finds that he has reached the end of his journey before he was aware that he was approaching it. Just so with this unceasing and most swift journey of life, which we make at the same pace whether waking or sleeping, those who are engrossed become aware of it only at the end. Chapter 10 Should I choose to divide my subject into heads with their separate proofs? Many arguments will occur to me by which I could prove that busy men find life very short. But Fabianus, who was none of your lecture-room philosophers of today, but one of the genuine and old-fashioned kind, used to say that we must fight against the passions with main force, not with artifice, and that the battle-line must be turned by a bold attack, not by inflicting pinpricks. That sophistry is not serviceable, for the passions must be not nipped, but crushed. Yet, in order that the victims of them may be censured, each for his own particular fault, I say that they must be instructed, not merely wept over. Life is divided into three periods, that which has been, that which is, and that which will be. Of these the present time is short, the future is doubtful, the past is certain. For the last is the one over which fortune has lost control, it is the one which cannot be brought back under any man's power. But men who are engrossed lose this, for they have no time to look back upon the past, and even if they should have, it is not pleasant to recall something they must view with regret. They are, therefore, unwilling to direct their thoughts backward to ill-spent hours, and those whose vices become obvious if they review the past, even the vices which were disguised under some allurement of momentary pleasure, do not have the courage to revert to those hours. No one willingly turns his thought back to the past, unless all his acts have been submitted to the censorship of his conscience, which is never deceived. He who has ambitiously coveted, proudly scorned, recklessly conquered, treacherously betrayed, greedily seized, or lavishly squandered, must needs fear his own memory. And yet this is the part of our time that is sacred and set apart, put beyond the reach of all human mishap, and removed from the dominion of fortune, the past which is disquieted by no one, by no fear, by no attacks of disease, this can never be troubled nor be snatched away. It is an everlasting and unanxious possession. The present offers only one day at a time, and each by minutes, but all the days of past time will appear when you bid them. They will suffer you to behold them and keep them at your will, a thing which those who are engrossed have no time to do. The mind that is untroubled and tranquil has the power to roam into all parts of its life, but the minds of the engrossed, just as if weighted by a yoke, cannot turn and look behind. And so their life vanishes into an abyss, and as it does no good, no matter how much water you pour into a vessel, if there is no bottom to receive and hold it, so with time. It makes no difference how much is given. If there is nothing for it to settle upon, it passes out through the chinks and holes of the mind. 
present time is very brief, so brief indeed, that to some there seems to be none, for it is always in motion, it ever flows and hurries on, it ceases to be before it has come, and can no more brook delay than the firmament or the stars, whose ever unresting movement never lets them abide in the same track. The engrossed, therefore, are concerned with present time alone, and it is so brief that it cannot be grasped, and even this is filched away from them, distracted as they are among many things. 